Shalom, everyone. Glad you could all join me. You make me nervous being all here, but you, you, I am glad you are here. We're going to look at uh, Shlach. Now, this is the third time in our par Parshas that God or somebody sends somebody out. And the first time we saw it was in Genesis, uh, the, the Parsha was Shlach, where Jacob sent the angels or the messengers to see Esau. The second time that we had the word shlach is Beshlach, which is an exodus when Pharaoh sent the Israelites out. And now here is the third time we're going to see the word, and this is where the spies are being sent out. And so we've got three of them going. For Ross's benefit, I decided I was going to find out, well, first off, let me read something to you. Go to, go to chapter 12, if you would, please because I want to tie chapter 12 to chapter 13, because it's a big question. And usually there is not two disasters, one following another, but here we have a case where there's two things happening. Remember Miriam speaks to her brother in an unkind way. Verse 13 or verse 15 begins, but says, so Miriam was quarantined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not journey until can, Miriam can you give, was. Can you give the chapter and verse Jill is asking? Okay, I'm going to chapter, 13, chapter 12, verse 15. Of Numbers. Of Numbers, yes. Versus Leviticus or any of the other books. So it's Numbers chapter 12. Okay, are you with me? All right. So Miriam was quarantined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not journey until Miriam was brought in. Then the people journeyed to Hezrot, and then they encamped in the wilderness of Paran. Now chapter 13 begins, Hashem spoke to Moses saying, send men, if you please, and let them spy out the land of Canaan. And I give to the children of Israel, one man each from the father's tribe shall you send, everyone a leader. And the word for leader here is Nasi, which means he's a prince who's being sent out. So the head of the clan, one of his sons is being sent at this particular point in time. So it's a, it's a large group. I also want you to understand we're going from the story of the spies, which is a terrible disaster, following a previous disaster. Now, normally the, the scriptures do not put two side by side like this. So there has to be a reason why Miriam's story is right next to the spies. And so I began to look and search. And so I came with several conclusions for Ross's benefit, because Ross is the chronologist. I went back and I looked and identified what was going on chronologically. So I'm going to give you a brief timeline. Now, this comes from Numbers chapter 10, verse 11, it says the departure from Mount Sion took place on the 20th of ER. They journeyed to uh, Kiryot Hatava, which took them one day, according to 1033. They arrived that night on the eve or on the 21st of ER. They remained there for 30 days. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 2. They departed from Kiryot. Atava on the 21st of Sidvan and, journey, and arrived at Hatzrot, according to Numbers 11, 35, that evening, after, uh, yeah, that evening on the 22nd of Sivan. Miriam slandered Moses that day, and they de she developed Zerats, and he was, she was healed from that, but she had to spend seven days in quarantine. So we're now at the 29th of Sivan. So it's at this point that Rashi writes that the spies were sent out on the 29th. So literally, this is a chronological event, one following the other, and Ross says no. Ross, are you agreeing or disagreeing? Our chronological is just that uh, there, there's a slight... Ross is humble. Go ahead. Okay. No? Yes. You're like me. You're plugged in wrong. But anyway, get it figured out. But that, so anyway, this is what I've understood it to be as I came to the, this chronology. Am I, Ross, are you there? Uh, am I? No. Okay. Oh, yeah. So 
Yeah, Anybody let else me go hear? ahead and Ross, keep going. We can hear. So we can hear Ross. it's Rashi who begins by he, he asking the he question. Can't hear any of us. Miriam's response, Miriam's trouble came because of evil speech. In other words, she talked about her brother in such a way as to be defaming of him. And so at that particular point in time, we go through the idea of what's a prophet and how you become a prophet and who's a prophet and all of those other things. But it was the unacceptable manner in which she spoke. That's the Lashan Hora out of that story. Now we're going to go to a story where, again, we find the men speaking out of order. So we're going to continue that same line. But then Rashi asks the question and answers it. Why is it that Miriam received a seven-day punishment and the spies bring about a 40-year punishment? What was the difference between the two? And that's where the, the whole lesson is going to kind of go to. So the next question that has to be asked is, when, who initiated this whole thing? Who caused the spies to be sent out? We have two possibilities here, because I want you to look at Numbers 13, 1 and 2. Here it says, if you please, let them spy out the land of Canaan and give, and I give to the children of Israel one man from each. That's what he's going to do. He's got 13, 12 spies going out, and it begins by saying, Moses said, send men. Now, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 1, you have an entirely different answer as to why these spies went out. So I want you to go to Deuteronomy 1 because it becomes significant. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, I want you to go to verse 22 and 23. Hope you're with me. It begins by saying, all of you approached me. Now, this is Moses talking. He's now going through this whole set of events. All of you approached me. So somebody approached Moses at this point and said, let us send men ahead of us and let them spy out the land and bring word back to us, the road on which we should ascend and the cities to which we should come. Notice the logic here. They wanted to send out spies in order to figure out what's the best direction to go. Understand then that the word that's used for spy in our story is actually the word used to survey. They were surveyors. They became spies because they didn't contact the villagers to let them know what they were looking at, but they were actually surveying the land. That's what it was, starts out. Now, notice verse 23. The idea was good in my eyes. So Moses listened to them, and after listening to them, made the decision, this sounds good. Notice what it says. So I took from you 12 men, one man from each tribe. Makes sense. Except when I go to the Talmud in, chap in Book of Soda, chapter 34b and 35a, it says that Moses, before giving them permission, went to God and asked God, should I send out the spies? God says, it's up to you. He doesn't make the decision for him. Understand, up until now, every decision was always made by God. God was totally controlling the entire environment. This is the first time that men actually have what we would call true choice. Now, men could have always decided to obey God or not to obey God. That, that was normal. But what he's now suggesting is they now have two choices. Yes, they can obey or disobey, but now you are going to make your own choices. A step up in this whole process. God is working with them in a new level. This is the level that you and I are at all the time because we don't hear God tell us everything that we're supposed to do. We have to conjure up our understanding of what to do. So this is where we're at in our story. So this story becomes very, very much more significant 
because it really deals with us. Yeah, it's framed in the idea of the spies, but it's really how we, you and I, adjust to the facts of choice. How do we handle it? Now, the people then come to him and ask the question, shouldn't we go out and spy out the land? Sounds good, but God didn't tell me that. So they go and ask God. He goes and asks God, comes back and says, sure, you may go spy out the land. Notice again, what he asks them to spy. And for that, it, it's very significant because he, well, first off, verse four, he begins to give the list of names that are going on there. And one of the names in verse eight, if you'd look at eight, it says, for the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, son of Nun, went. By verse 16, these are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. Moses called Hoshea, son of Nun, Joshua. All of a sudden, one of the characters is going to have a name change. Now, we know who the character is. We know Joshua. Actually, his name was Yehoshua, but we, for our Bible, call him Joshua. He receives an entire name change. The entire change in his name is one letter. The letter is a Yud. Now, people then begin to ask, okay, why is he changing his name? What, what is going on? Now, he had a sacred name to begin with, but now it becomes even more difficult. And it becomes very significant what he's calling him. I want you to understand the Yud. Where did it come from? According to the rabbis, the Yud came from Sarah. Remember, Sarah's name wasn't always Sarah. Sarah's name was Sariah. God took the Yud off of her name and replaced it with a hey. So that Yud, according to the Talmud, argued, why are you removing me from the princess's name? I have another job for you. What's your other job? I'll tell you later. Numbers now tells us this is what the, he saved the Yud for, for this new name. The name now becomes Joshua because, because he added the Yud to his name. But we're not through understanding all of this. We need to go and look at the significance of names. Hebrew names are far different than, than my name. My mom and dad thought that it was a good name, so they gave it to me. I, I don't have a grandfather. I don't have any relatives with the name Steve, but that's what I became. But in the Jewish cases, they always give their children names that are significant. And so in giving them a significant name, Joshua, Joshua, Hoshea, already had one. But something was going to have to change in him. He had always been studying in the sense of, of Moses. Remember, he's the one who stayed there. He was constantly with him. Did not want to part from him in any way, shape, or form until this event when he's now going to be going out to look at the land. So this will be his first experience away. And so in his first experience then, God some, needs to change something. And so Moses calls him Yehoshua. Now, up until now, when names are normally changed, it was because they were ill. So oftentimes a, a, a Jew who is ill, people will call him by a different name, like Haim, meaning life or extending your life or Raphael to, to be healed something that would fit with the, what they're asking for. So the question is, what is it that fits his name at this particular point in time? The name is now going to change because of the spiritual value that Joshua will have. Joshua obviously knew the Torah. That's not the question. What becomes the question is, what value does Sarah's Yud add to Joshua? That becomes a significant point. So as we go through this whole story, then, 
there's a, a, a Parsha or a Midrash that's Bami Bar Rabbah 2111, which tells us the spies are going to have a negative report. And in this negative report, all the men over the age of 20 begin to weep. They accept the report. But none of the women do. The power of Sarah's Yud in Yehoshua caused the women, when they heard Joshua speak, not to accept the conclusions of the men, none of them. So here we go, looking on through this. He begins then to note the, the, the surveyor's report. I want you to skip down to verse 27. In verse 27, we begin the report itself. It says, how long for this evil assembly that provokes complaints against me? I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel whom they provoked against me. Say to them, as I live the word of Hashem, and if I shall not do to you as I have spoken in my ears, well, you can imagine what goes next. Do you understand God becomes provoked by the, the decisions of the men. He's not provoked by the decisions of the women. It's the men who are going to suffer, not the women. Remember, the, the end story here is the fact that for 40 years, they will walk through the desert, and the men will die at certain points along the line. On the ninth of Av, every year, the Jewish men would go out and dig a hole in the sand outside their, of the village. And as they dug the hole in the sand, they would lay in it. And if they were alive the next morning, they would get up and they would bury the ones that didn't. Every, 20, every ninth of Av. Imagine that. He provided for them something that's rather unusual. Okay. So the men died. All except two men and the tribe of Levi. Well, why the tribe of Levi? Because Levi's tribe did not participate in the spy story. It said that 12 were sent out. The 12 came from the other tribes. Joseph's tribe, remember, was split in two, Ephraim and Manasseh. So those tribes all went out. But Levi's tribe did not go. Aaron did not send his sons. They stayed in the camp. So they, plus Caleb, plus Joshua, managed to make it through. Even Moses and Aaron didn't make it. Only the others got through at this particular point in time. Now, God gave no specific directions at all for this whole event. And at the same point in time, in not giving any directions, he was giving them a new direction, something that was not obvious to them, but something that was going to happen. And so as we go through our story, I want to look at the two levels of choices. And the first level I already told you about, it's real easy. It's the, it's the fact that whatever God said, you either did it or you didn't do it. That was your choice. But this is the second one is the choice that, well, Rabbi uh, Zalman spoke and he said, our soul is literally a part of God, and deep down, our soul has but a single desire to fulfill the will of God. A Jew, and I want to put in this point, a Gentile, is neither willing nor is he able to tear himself away from God. We can't tear ourselves away from God even if we wanted to. And yet, God gives us the choice to turn our back on him. Amazing in and of itself. And yet we, those of you who are here and many more, all want to be in God's presence. We want to follow God. We want to follow his choice. But look at the spies. When it was all said and done, they had to have a reason why. And several reasons are going to be given. One reason is going to be given is the, is the fact that the Rev Rav talked them out of it. The Rev Rav didn't want to go into the land anyway. Well, 
that's that's a wonderful decision, but that's not the exact answer that I was thinking of. There's another one that says the fact that they didn't want to go because look how good they had it. What did they have to do while they were in the wilderness outside of go outside their tent and find their manna each and every day? What did they have to do other than to study God's word, which they didn't have, but they always began to talk and teach. It was a time of spiritualness. Can you imagine? Now, you folks are working. I'm, I'm retired, so it's, it's a different story for me. How much time can you give to God in study? Now, while you work, your time is split. If Israel would have gone into the land, just imagine how little time was left because now they've got to fight for the land. Now they've got to take the land and till it and use it, make their, make their living off of the land. All of that has to happen. Less time for study. So the intellectual probably said, well, we, we just can't study. We just can't be a spiritual this way. And so they chose not to go. But they're not the only ones who, who finally came to the conclusion that this wasn't such a good idea. They, they, they looked at what was going on around them. Look how big they are. Look, look how many problems you have when you go out into the world. If you didn't go out into the world, you wouldn't have this problem. If you didn't leave your house, imagine how many people you don't offend or don't offend you. Just imagine. All of those things probably got a little bit into their way. Lots of things were happening around them. Now, Miriam wasn't faultless in what she said. Her problem probably was the fact that how she said it and where she said it. Remember, Miriam decided to confront Moses in front of her brother. But that was not without having already talked with her brother about it before she came to him. And we're not sure that there wasn't anybody else listening in the background. But we know that the conversation went as she said, why aren't you? Well, she didn't even say that, did she? The problem was the fact how she said it. And for that, she received a seven-day sentence. Now, the spies, on the other hand, as we look at them, what is it that they, they could have understood? Because remember, if the chronology that I gave you is correct, and, and Ross thinks I'm probably off, if the chronology is correct, the one thing that happens is those men had just witnessed the seven-day confinement of Moses' sister, and they would have known what she did. But it didn't stop them from doing similar. You know, once, once you know somebody's done something wrong, why repeat it? And that's really what begins to, to percolate as you go through this whole thing. So Miriam's sin was a negative, but it was not intended to be hurting. But she did it in front of Aaron. It should have been the two of them off to the side. No, I'm not gonna, I'm going to skip my own personal experience here, but one of the things that, that really comes out is the fact that there are issues that are sensitive. Remember, Moses sent them out. Where should they have gone before informing everybody in the camp? Where should that conversation have been? It should have been one with God, then with Moses, then all of them. Moses included, could have made the statements. Because remember, when they give the statements to, to Moses, Moses and Aaron fall on their faces and begin to weep. They begin to pray because they understand the significance of what these people are about to do. And here you are, the leader. Do you want your congregation to go down the rabbit hole? Do you want them to fall apart? Well, of course you don't. So you begin to Weep, And that's when Caleb and Joshua 
took up the cross. They took up the answers. They stepped in to speak. They didn't say that the spies lied. No way, shape, or form did the spies lie. The only thing that they could say was, we can do it. You know, the spies left out one very important factor. They had been spending all of this time with God, and God had been making all these choices. And then when God was making these choices, he was also creating miracles. The miracles of the quail, the miracles of the manna, the miracles of water. All of that was being every day. Miracles don't prove anything. They prove that. All they are are signs from God, but they don't prove anything because these men didn't hear the message. All they did was see the message. And that's the fact that these guys were really tall. They were the Annex or the Anakin. They were the Nephilim. They were the giants. They were Goliath's family. Those people, that's what they were thinking they saw. In fact, the land was so fierce that it ate the people. Well, actually, it didn't eat the people. They probably witnessed a burial where they opened up the ground and buried them. But again, they did the same thing for themselves in the wilderness. Over and over again, we begin to see something that's very, very difficult to understand. You know, Caleb went on the trip. And I can imagine as they are going through the land, we don't know what what point they ended that Caleb ended up at Hebron, Hebron. We don't know when he did that, but he didn't go up there by himself. It says at Eshkol that they they cut the grapevines and they were bringing them back. So it must have been before they started bringing back the grapevine. But as he went up, he must have been listening to their conversations, and I'm sure he probably interacted with them. But it was making no point. It was, it was useless. So Caleb left the group. And he went to Hebron. Went to Hebron by himself. And the question then became, what was his purpose? Well, according to Soda 35a, he went there to pray at the gravesite of the patriarchs. Praying that God would spare them. That was his prayer. He was interceding for them before it happened. And I would imagine Moses was too from where he was at. But Caleb had heard all the conversations. He knew what was going on. And from that, he began to formulate his understandings. And I can imagine even on the way back, Caleb was probably still jawing at them, talking to them about what they're about to do. Over and over again, the conversations must have been rolling along. Now, Moses ends up speaking in the presence of all the congregation because, you see, the the problem was the fact that they all spoke in front of him. And now he is there trying to save the people because we read what what God wanted to do. Uh, Let's take them out and we'll start over again. Now, Moses, at the the case of of the golden calf, he prayed for them and God forgave. He doesn't even bother to pray for them here. The only thing he has in his bag is the desire, or I shouldn't call it desire. He witnesses, well, if you take them out, God, what will the rest of the world think? What will the Egyptians think if they're all of a sudden taken out? What about the Amalekites? And what about all of the others, the Canaanites, the ones whose land we're supposed to go into? What will they think of you? Now, I can't imagine that that changed God's mind, but I imagine what it did was cause Moses to reflect and God to hear. And at that point in time, the whole thing was decided. You spent 40 days doing all of this. You can now spend 40 years doing all of that. And so they were left with this whole idea. Oh, by the way, there's one other thing in the Talmud, in Soda 35a. 
there's a part where it says that the Hebrews uh, said to him, and I can't remember where I got it from. But anyway, it says that the Hebrew word for than us can also mean than him. In other words, they think they can see God and God is not big enough to save them. How little is their God? You know, there's so many times when people begin to talk to me about God. How big is your God? I know with Joe, I, I, I made the statement one time that God was energy. Well, how do you define him? How big is he? How little is he? He doesn't have hands. He doesn't have feet. He doesn't have any of those attributes that we have. So how do you define him? I call him energy because there's nothing that can, can be outside of him. We're all inside of God. All of us. If God quit thinking about us, we wouldn't be here. And do you realize scientifically every second, there's a nanosecond within that second in which everything disappears and it's built again. Science. Quantum theory, if you want to go back that far. So Moses then pleads. Now, remember, God said, well, you, you, you guys have tested me 10 times already. How much more do I need to go through to prove to you that I'm God? Well, Rashi began to create a list. And he said, first off, twice at the sea, twice with manna, twice with quail. At the sea, the people declared, just as we go up from this side, so we, the Egyptians will go up from the other side. And they lacked faith as they were witnessing the miracle of the splitting of the sea. The people complained about the manna that they were receiving because it was unique. It didn't look like anything they had ever eaten before. Now, the people also complained, well, we don't have the meat, but manna could taste like meat. There was nothing it couldn't taste like, but it just doesn't look right. So over time, even in the midst of miracles, they complained, just like sometimes even we do. So the ninth of Av became not only this problem, but we know that it cost them the two temples. We know that the idea of the uh, Spanish Inquisition began on the same day. Also, the same day was the day of uh, uh, exiling of the Jews from England. It's also the day in which King Ferdinand of Austria was, was killed. And at that point in time, the Jews became fair game amongst the Russians and others. Now, the whole thing speaks to the fact that we have a purpose in life. And God was about to give them their purpose in life. He wanted them to make a choice. A choice to follow him without having true guidance. That is the scariest part. So how does one gain true guidance? Because we're in need of it. Oh, is our country in need of it? We're in need of guidance. And the only place that we have for certain where we can know and find God's word is the Torah. The Torah provides our guidance. The acts that we do, the mitzvahs that we complete, all help to put this world together in the right way. Because you see, in the world to come, it will only be those things that are right will eventually survive. All of the things done for self will simply disappear. So as you're going, th as I was going through this, and I rushed through it so I could give you time to talk and reflect, because last time you did a lot of talking, but I tried to make it easy because I wouldn't quote Rashi for you. I quoted everybody else, and you all knew Rashi, so I, I guess I just kind of gave it away. But as we're thinking about it, think about your own choices in life, the Torah study time, the mitzvahs that you do, the relationships that you have created. And, per and keep going. But anyway, I'm done. I'll let you guys begin to reflect. Does anybody have anything to reflect on? <laughs>